she wrote. Oh, okay. Good. That may have been worse than driving yeah. herself. <laughs> yeah, he's not the Anyway, um, y'all turn to First Samuel chapter 15. As you're turning there, I want to. You ever notice how we use the Bible sometimes uh, to our advantage? Yeah. yeah. A traffic cop pulled over Brother Tommy for speeding. <laughs> and he reminded the officer, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. <laughs> and as the cop handed him the ticket, he quoted, Go then and sin no more. <laughs> So, you know, sometimes you can take a little out of context, right? <clears throat> you know, I think sometimes we don't give Job's wife enough credit. Yeah. I believe she was a prophet because she knew that if she didn't get Job to just curse God and die, she was going to have to have ten more children. <laughs> But it didn't work. He didn't do it, and she had ten more children. <laughs> um, we're going to talk tonight about Saul's decline. It all started out real good. The kingship dynasty of Israel. He was the very first king they ever had. And a good one to start with. Uh, Samuel anoints him as king and everybody's happy even Samuel and if you know the story to begin with they said we want a king we want to be like everybody else Mm -hmm. and the Bible says that when they did that when they told Samuel we want a king that it it grieved the heart of Samuel but after he after God told him to make Saul King, that he was even excited. Yeah. He, he he knew that it was God that told him to anoint uh, Saul as king, and Saul was a humble man. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was uh, he was a good man, mm-hmm. and we're going to see tonight that he he even sought after God. Yeah. But then things went sour. Yeah. Uh, what went wrong? Mm. That's the big question. What went wrong? Where did it begin? Where did his decline start? Because that's the important part. Yes. If we can nail that down, then we might can prevent that from possibly happening to us. Amen. So we're here in 1 Samuel 15 and verse 10 and 11. The Bible says, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me. That's where we, that's where we know that Saul was at some point following God because he could not have turned back right. from following him unless he was already following him. Amen. And hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for Your Word, and I especially thank You for this passage because we're all so close to that downward spiral, a lot closer than we realize, and we need Your help. Father, I pray that You would help us to see in Your Word tonight what we need to see so that we can possibly eliminate that from happening or at least correct it because it already is. Lord, I pray that You would help us and help me to say only what I should tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, Amen. Amen. He was following God in the beginning and here at this point it was evident that he was not. Mm-hmm. Now, somewhere along the way, 
he quit. Somewhere along the way, he no longer was following God. Right. At this point, he had already been away from God for some time. We don't know for how long. Right. The Bible doesn't say. What we do know is he was away from God. If you'll look back in chapter 14, turn, page, turn a page back to chapter 14 and verse 35. The Bible says, And Saul built an altar unto the Lord. That's good. But here's the problem. The same was the first altar that he built unto the Lord. Now that's a problem because Saul had been king now for over two years. And he's just now building an altar to the Lord. The, the altar represents him reaching out to God, calling out to God. It represents that he recognizes, I need God. Two years after he became king. Here's the problem. Saul, at this point, was in a pickle. He was between a rock and a hard place. Right. And he knew he needed to do something. Samuel was not present here. Yeah. I'm sure many times when he got into a little bit of a, a problem, he would go find Samuel and say, Samuel, what do I need to do here? Right. Samuel would pray and then God would tell Samuel what to tell Saul and then... Saul would go on and do whatever he said. And Samuel wasn't here. We cannot live our spiritual life on the benefits of other people's spiritual life. Amen. That's good. That doesn't work. No. That happens a lot. Or I should say the attempt of it happens a lot. Well, my my parents are godly people. I hear that a lot. Yeah. I was talking to a guy about the Lord one time, and he says, you know, my wife's dad is a minister. Yeah. And I told him, I said, that's great. But when you get to heaven, and God says, why should I let you into heaven? That answer ain't going to work. Amen. We cannot trust in the spirituality of someone in our family to get us to heaven. We, we can't even trust in their spirituality to receive God's blessings. Amen. That does happen sometimes. Yes. It's evident in Scripture, but we cannot trust in that. Okay? <clears throat> so, Saul finally builds an altar. He was a little late for that by the way. Mm -hmm. Why did he wait? Why did he wait two years? By the way, I'm, I'm saying two years. It could have been three. could have been more. But the Bible does say that after two years, mm -hmm. and then it starts the story. Yeah. It could have been longer than that. But why did he wait? Things were going real good mm -hmm. in Israel mm -hmm. in the beginning. One reason is because he was following God during that beginning stage. Another reason is Samuel the prophet was there kind of, you know, trying to judge them and keep them in line and correct things that were needing to be corrected. But the Bible's clear in this story that Samuel was getting old. Yes. Mm -hmm. His influence was waning, depleting. But in the beginning, things were good. Right after Saul was made king, he was winning battle after battle after battle. Things were going real good. Have you ever noticed that when your health is good and you have enough money in the bank to pay the bills and then some, and the relationships that you have with the people you care about are cruising along real good, that you tend to drift away from your personal Bible study? I think that in the beginning time of Saul's kingship, he spoke with God. 
He followed God. He wanted to do what God wanted done. He had a desire to be pleasing in His sight. He didn't at this stage here. That was evident. But in the beginning, He did. What happened? I think that part of the thing that happened was, one, He didn't build an altar. And I think it was because things were going too good. You ever notice that sometimes, many times, if not always, God gets our attention the best when we're down in the bottom. In fact, we don't even want to look up until there's nowhere else to look but up. Because we're at the bottom. Right? right? That's how it works with us. <clears throat> when things are going great, beware. Mm. That's good. Amen. Yeah. Look what happened to Saul because of it. He went into a decline of which he never, ever recovered. Right. That's true. And it was because things were going good and because he did not set a time to spend with the Lord he didn't build an altar till it was too late Amen. by the way if you read through this story I think a couple of verses after that the Bible says after he built the altar he prayed to God and God didn't even answer him yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do you ever feel that way mm. where that you're praying during a time where you have not been seeking God and all of a sudden it's time to pray and you pray and you don't get an answer. Hopefully it wasn't too late like it was for Saul. Yeah. But if you're under the sound of my voice tonight, it's probably not too late. Amen. That's the good news. <clears throat> that's why it's vital to create a habit of personal devotion time a habit now some people will tell you that it's not good to have a habit it shouldn't be a habit you shouldn't do it repetitiously <clears throat> and I agree to some, de some degree because when we do things repetitiously then we fall in the category of the Pharisees and Jesus said be careful that when you pray, that you pray these repetitious prayers. Yeah, yeah. Dear Lord, thank you for the food. Amen. Mm. Be careful about that. Switch it up sometimes. But it is good to have a habit, if you want to call it even a ritual, of spending time with God on a regular basis. Amen. That's a good habit to have. <clears throat> Saul didn't have that habit. Look what happened to him. <clears throat> if you don't have a regular set time of prayer and Bible study, you're already sliding. That's true. And you don't even know it. That's true. Amen. Saul didn't. We don't either. Why is that? Because the devil's good at what he does. Mm. He takes real, small, microscopic moves in taking us away from where God wants us to be. Yeah, yeah. So that we don't recognize it. We don't see it happening. But if you don't have a regular set time of prayer and Bible study, you're already sliding backwards. Mm -hmm. Don't wait until tragedy strikes before you call out to God. Amen. It don't work that way. Why would God give us what we ask for when we don't give Him what He asks for? Mm. Good. It's like I'm going to consistently say no to God for weeks and weeks and months, maybe years, then all of a sudden say, God, I need your help, and expect 
Uh, yes. It don't work that way with you and I, does it? Somebody that tells me no over and over and over and over, then asks me for a favor. I look forward to saying no. <laughs> That's how we are. Why would we expect God to bless us when we're disobedient to Him? In 1 Samuel 15, look in verse 1. Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over His people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. I think he was reminding Saul, God told me to anoint you to be king over Israel. Now listen. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. And spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. So what's he saying? It's real simple. Go kill the Amalekites and their animals. Don't leave a single one of them alive. That was the command. Right? Right. Verse 7. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur that is over against Egypt. <laughs> That's pretty good. He said, all right, Samuel, I'm going to go do what you said. Then in verse 8, And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep. Saul killed every living, breathing person except one. I would say, if you do a percentage, that Saul was 99% obedient. Right? Maybe 99.6. I don't know how many people he killed. But he was awfully obedient here. <clears throat> then, on top of this, they killed all their animals except the, some of them that were really good and they were going to take them and offer them to God as a sacrifice. Sounds like a good plan, doesn't it? Mm. But it wasn't. And the reason it wasn't was because it didn't line up with what God told them to do. Right. Incomplete obedience is still disobedience. Right, right. <clears throat> and that's what we try to do. <clears throat> Sometimes God's plan doesn't appear to make sense to us, but it's still the best plan. For instance, the Bible says, love your enemies. Really? I want you to think for just a second of one of your enemies. Whoever that may be. Don't raise your hand and don't blurt out their name. They may be in this room. Okay? But think about one of your enemies. Do you love them? Have you showed love to them? That's hard, isn't it? Mm. Sometimes, I'm just being honest, my wife is my enemy. I don't like her. She's aggravating <clears throat> to me. But then I find out later it was my fault. <laughs> really? I, I, I caused it. I really did. <clears throat> But during the time that I didn't like her, I didn't want to love her. Mm. I've had people that I've worked with before who were, the, the best word I could describe them is just sorry. Mm. Just sorry. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't like them. So loving them 
seemingly was even harder. Which, by the way, God never tell, tells us in His Word that we got to like somebody. But He does tell us to love them. Amen. There is a difference. <clears throat> God says to love your enemies. That's His plan. Yeah. But it don't yeah. sound right mm. to us. He also says, give to others when you're in need. That's odd, isn't it? He also says, love your husband or your wife even when they're not lovable. That ain't what the world's telling us. The world's telling us there's other fish in the sea. I was sitting there talking with a couple of guys a few months ago. And one of the guys was complaining about his wife. And then the other guy said, well, there's other fish in the sea. And so I said, that's true. But he only has one fish. And he only has right to one fish. Amen. Amen. But that's what the world's telling us, isn't it? Yeah. God's plan sometimes does appear to not make any sense to us. But it always works and it's always best. Amen. Saul, Samuel told Saul, go kill all of them. When Saul gets out there, he starts looking at these animals, which, and by the way, I've never figured out why he kept a gang. Never have figured it out. If anybody's got an answer on that one, I'd like to hear it. I've never figured that one out. <clears throat> Why they kept the good sheep and oxen to sacrifice to God, that kind of sounds reasonable. But it wasn't God's plan. Mm-hmm. Therefore, even though it sounded good, it wasn't good. It wasn't the best. By the way, when the good takes the place of the best, the good becomes the enemy of the best. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to drop a 20 in the offering plate. It's best to put 10% of your income there. Right. Right. <clears throat> when you've disappointed your kids, your husband, your wife, because of a bad decision you've made or anger outburst or... Uh, just fail to keep a promise that you've made. It's good to find something kind to do for them, but it's best to just go to them, own up to your mistake, and apologize and say, I was wrong. Amen. I'm Amen. sorry. That's best. Amen. Well, what we want to do is substitute it with something that's good. Mm. But when we replace the best with something good then that good thing becomes the enemy of the best thing. Yeah. That's what happened with Saul, right? They were doing a good thing. Mm-hmm. They were trying to bring these animals and sacrifice them to God. But it wasn't what God said to do. Right. That's what made it sin. <clears throat> it wouldn't have been any different if Saul would have just totally refused to do what God said. That's right. Amen. He would have still lost his kingdom. Mm-hmm. Incomplete obedience is still disobedient. Now we're talking about this because Saul was on a downward decline, a slope, a slippery slope. One that he never recovered up. Yeah. And if you and I don't want to wind up there, then you and I need to consider ourselves and where we're at. Because again, we don't know, we don't always recognize, in fact, we seldom recognize when we're slipping. We think we're A-OK. Everything's hunky-dory. I'm at church, ain't I? Look at verse 10, chapter 15. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, 
It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he's turned back from following me and hath not for performed my commandments. Yeah. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place and has gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul. By the way, Samuel's coming to Saul to confront him about his sin. And I think Saul knew that. Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. I'm sure he said that with a big old smile on his face. The problem is, he was lying. And he knew he was lying, I think. He knew what Saul, or what Samuel told him to do, what God said. He knew it. Kill them all. But he didn't. When we are declining, by the way, we're slipping, we tend to lie about things a little bit more. We tend to not portray the truth the way the truth is. We leave out certain elements of the truth on purpose. But really all of that is just called lying. Just like Saul did. <clears throat> Verse 14, he says, after Saul lied to him with a big grin on his face, he said in verse 15, or verse 14, And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? In other words, Samuel says, No, you didn't. What do I hear back there? What's up with that? Saul then says, well, let's just look at it. Verse 15, And Saul said, They, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice unto God. By the way, to sacrifice unto, look what he said here, unto thy God. Not my God. Thy God. It's important that we recognize these words. Amen. Because you see Saul's severe spiritual state here. First he lied. Then he started the blame game. Mm-hmm. Well, if, if he hadn't have done that, then I wouldn't have said that. Right. If she hadn't said the so-and-so and so-and-so, I wouldn't have reacted that way. Well, if if they would do things a little bit differently at work, then I wouldn't do that. If he wouldn't have cut me off in traffic, then I wouldn't have... Whatever you did. We do the blame game, don't we? Right. He was pretty quick to point out what he did right, though. Did you notice that? And the rest, we have utterly destroyed. We. We. I'm part of this one. We utterly destroyed. And Samuel said, verse 17, When thou wast little in thine own sight, Wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? By the way, this blame game, when a person is walking with Jesus, they have the integrity to admit their wrong, their sin, their failures. But when a person is declining from their walk with Jesus, they begin to be defensive, can't admit their faults, and instead blame other people yeah, for true. their faults. That's true. So I got a question for you. 
Are you a confessor or a blamer? You blame other people for the things that you do wrong? For the mistakes you make? You get defensive when people point out something that you didn't do right? Get angry? Solomon has something to say about that in Proverbs 15. <clears throat> in fact, let's turn there and look at it. Psalms, or I'm sorry, Proverbs chapter 15. <clears throat> I was just looking at that this morning. <clears throat> Verse 5. A fool despiseth his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> regardeth reproof. That means somebody gets on to you and you, you think about it. Not in an angry way, but in a way of saying, could they be right? Yeah. Am I really doing this? Do I need to make something right with God here? Do I need to correct something in my life? Or do you say, how dare they say that to me? Who do they think they are? I mean, look what they're doing. And they're going to accuse me of this. That's where Saul was at the end of his decline. Not the very end, but when Saul or Samuel finally pointed it out to him, that's where he was. He was doing the blame game. He wasn't trying to accept responsibility of his actions. He was trying to put it on other people. Do you do that? <clears throat> Saul was in serious decline here and where does that put us? If we're doing that. He was he was at a point of no return at this point. Mm -hmm. Where does that put us? Don't ever blame other people for your mistakes. Verse 17, I believe, tells us where the beginning of his downward spiral started. Amen. He was he was prideful. Yeah. Saul had never had that much money in his life mm. until he became king. Right. His in, his income was probably triple figures. Mm -hmm. He had more authority and power at this point than ever before. Amen. He could just speak the word and somebody was going to die. I think pride started to get up in him a little bit. Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> that ought to make our eyebrows go up. Mm. Pride because we suffer from that. I know I do. I was just thinking in preparation of this sermon. I, Bruce Scott, am on the edge of decline. Because I suffer from this problem of pride. Sometimes, I don't know why, sometimes I get to thinking, and I'm, I'm all that and a bag of chips. And I'm not even the crumbs that you find in the bottom when you've finished eating the bag of chips. <laughs> but my pride, it comes up in me sometimes. And it does it in all kinds of ways in all kinds of different times of the day and of my life. Sometimes it comes up when someone points out that I did something I shouldn't have done. And I get defensive. That's pride. Sometimes it comes up when I get to looking at something that I've accomplished and I think, wow. Yeah, look at that. Pride gets us. Pride makes us think that we are so close to God that when God looks at us, He looks at one of His most prized possessions. That's pride. 
Pride gets us in all kinds of ways. And it was the beginning, I believe, of Saul's decline. Yes, amen. Where does that put us? <clears throat> I don't know that I'll ever get the complete victory over pride, but I sure want to. I pray about it a lot. That's just one of my problems. <clears throat> Saul declined because of the pride. He also declined because he didn't have a regular habit of spending time with God on a daily basis. How are we doing there? <clears throat> then he started the blame game mm. when he got caught. How are we doing there? Mm. <clears throat> if you see any of these signs of decline in yourself, now is the best time to take corrective action. Amen. <clears throat> Sin has magnetism. The closer you get, the stronger of a pull that it has on you. And once you connect, it's hard to get loose from it. Real hard to get loose from it. You try, you just can't break loose. I know people that are there right now. I don't want to be that person. Do you? That's how sin is. And sin is always leading to death and destruction. Amen. It tastes good to start with. Feels good. Looks good. Is good for a period of time. Short yeah. period of time. Hmm. Then reality sets in and it ain't pretty no more. Right. Then we're looking for a way to break loose from it. But we can't. It's got us. So now is the best time to make correction Amen. if we see any of these signs of decline. Mm. Let's pray. Father, thank You for loving us and thank You for giving us this, this account in Your Word that happened in Israel through Saul. Lord, I pray that You would help us to see what we have not been seeing in ourself. And Lord, help us to make correction. Help us, Father, to repent and turn back to You and have a change of mind and a change of direction so that we don't wind up like Saul did. Thank You so much, Father. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 Let's stand and turn the page. 250. We'll, we'll try this. Uh...